Okay, this is an audio review of chapter 15, Hate Crimes, Mass Murder, Terrorism, and Homeland Security. Easy peasy, right? Let's cram all these things together in one chapter. What could go wrong? Okay, so in the chapter, we're going to look at some of the bias motivations associated with hate crimes, aka being a bigot, uh, summarize some of the key anti-hate crime legislation, look at some theories and how they try and explain it. Um, we're going to look at the various forms and rates of multi-side in the U.S. Fun. And then, of course, distinguish terrorist activities from more conventional forms of crime and some of the factors that have contributed to the historical and current context of terrorism, which could be like its own entire class, let alone its own chapter, let alone we're definitely not going to really be able to scratch more than the surface of that one. Um, discuss some of the theoretical explanations of terrorism. Homeland, talk about what Homeland Security is, why it's there, some of the agencies that make it up, and some of the controversies related to civil liberties. Fun. Lots of way too much stuff for one chapter. Okay, so I'll try and be quick, but you know me. I'm not quick. Okay, so what is a hate crime? Uh, a traditional offense such as, you know, murder or vandalism, but there's this additional factor of bias. So Congress defines a hate crime as a criminal offense against person or property motivated in whole or in part by an offender's bias against a religion, race, disability, ethnic origin, or sexual orientation. So the FBI provides various factors that should be considered when determining if an offense was a crime motivated by bias. So if the offender and the victim were of a different race, religion, disability, sexual orientation, ethnicity, gender, or gender identity. So for example, if the victim was African American and the offender's white, right? That's a that's an example of when you might be looking at something like this. And we've seen, again, this isn't hypothetical, we've seen a lot of high profile cases, especially in recent years, of white supremacists going to places targeting communities um, simply because of their racial or ethnic origin, or in the case of you know, um, sometimes destroying property like mosques, uh, Jewish cemeteries and synagogues have been attacked, all of this stuff. So we'll talk about that. It's not, um, it's, it's been on the uptick, unfortunately, because of the kind of hateful white supremacist rhetoric that's like flying through our society right now. Um, you know, in 2016, Trump kind of lifted up a rock and emboldened a lot of folks um, out of the shadows, right? You got those tiki torch folks kind of chanting around and all of that. And a lot of them are just putting on suits and ties instead of white hoods anymore and trying to legitimize themselves, uh, calling themselves white nationalists as if that's better than um, horrible racist garbage monster. Um, but it really just means the same thing. So we'll get into that. Okay, so um, the bias itself can be oral comments, written statements, or gestures, um, you know, shouting things at people, um, drawings, markings, symbols, or graffiti, right? So again, um, the examples like when they will paint swastikas on Jewish synagogues and things like that. Um, uh, so certain objects, items, or things that we indicate or that, that connect to bias. So for instance, um, again, wearing sheets or hoods covering one's head. Um, or burning crosses, which again, it's kind of retro at this point, right? These folks are just walking around in broad daylight with their weird tiki torches. And I really fall for the tiki torch company because they had to put out a statement like, we don't support this. And you're like, yeah, obviously. You're just about making crap so people can hang out in their backyard and drink. Like it wasn't supposed to be that. Anyway, um, I guess they didn't have their pitchforks and normal torches on already. So, um, okay, going back to the list. Um, another way to kind of look at if it might be a hate crime is if the victim is a member of a specific group that's overwhelmingly outnumbered by other residents in the area where they live and the, where the incident took place. So if the victim was visiting a neighborhood where previous hate crimes had been committed because of any of those factors, that could be part of it too. Um, so several incidents occur in the same locality or about the same time. Um, that's also a, a, an indication. Um, if the substantial portion of the community where the crime occurred perceived the incident as motivated by bias, um, if the victim was engaged in activities related to their identity, so for example, like if you are participating in a pride celebration and someone attacks you because of your sexual orientation, it's you're pretty you pretty much have a hate crime right there. 
um, if the incident coincided with a holiday or date of significance for a particular group. So for instance, um, you know, Transgender Day of Remembrance or, you know, um, MLK Day, Rosh Hashanah, you know, things like that. Anyway, um, let's see here. Sometimes it's actually groups themselves that are acting and not just individuals because there are many hate groups as the Southern Poverty Law Center tracks um, and they often operate kind of in tandem with each other. Oh, okay, there might be a historically established animosity between the victims and the offender groups. Or if the victim, although not a member of one of those targeted groups, was supporting a victim's group, right? So you have like that white supremacist that drove his car into a Black Lives Matter protest and killed a white uh, protester. And then hate crimes are not exclusively federal. There are also state and, you know, um, there's also kind of civil rights violations at play. So sometimes people will um, be convicted federally and then later, as with the video and your additional resources, um, they will be charged in a civil case with uh, taking away or, you know, violating someone's civil rights. Okay, so let's get into the different kinds of Okay, looking at the different types of hate crimes that they cover in the chapter. Um, and this is, you know, again, coming from the FBI's Uniform Crime Report that tracks, you know, a lot of these incidents, um, that bias is typically um, connected to these factors, right? Racial or ethnic origin. So, you know, someone is a different race or ethnicity. Um, again, you've seen communities targeted because um, they're black, because they are immigrant groups or are assumed to be immigrant groups. You have folks that have been, and again, a lot of these mass shootings we see this in, uh, these white supremacists that go out, they write some stupid online manifesto, and then they go out and just shoot a, indiscriminately groups of people in random places, um, or they go into communities just to target folks. Um, so you also, though, saw an uptick of this during the pandemic against Asian Americans that were targeted and often just beaten on the street um, because of some sort of supposed connection to COVID, which, again, I mean, not that you can logic any of this because no bias is based in logic. These people are hateful because they're not thinking in a logic based way. Right. Um, to hate someone because of something they can't control about themselves, like their sexual orientation or their race or their religion is just insane, right? But again, the idea then that somehow this person walking down the street has some connection to some sort of conspiracy of spreading a virus across the world is so completely like five steps beyond unhinged, dumb, biased thinking. But it does show that in these times when, um, you know, kind of tensions or, or, or problems happen in society at all times, there's this great author named Naomi Klein that talks about it, which she calls shock doctrine. The idea that, you know, when there's times of upheaval, oftentimes, um, you know, the ways in which it kind of becomes disaster capitalism. But that's a side note. But anyway, basically, you know, what she would say in this context is that people were already hateful against Asian Americans and then they just use this as their justification to use violence against them, right? Because it doesn't actually make sense. And the fact that the rhetoric around a unprecedented global virus, you know, uh, epidemic was to somehow blame it against China or the Chinese and then to therefore extrapolate that to people living in other countries that have nothing to do with that or often aren't even Chinese themselves, um, but then were facing violence or being targeted or being silenced. So, you know, this is just a sad reality of how sometimes when turmoil happens, people use it for political ends to stir up the pot. And the inevitable end of that is people in marginalized communities that are being targeted are going to face more violence as a result. Okay, so um, sometimes it's religious based on, you know, um, viewpoints, um, especially in our country, it's anti-Jewish or anti-Islamic bias or hatred, um, disability, right, against people with physical, 
mental or other kinds of you know processing disorders or the disabilities um folks that you know either because they're female or because they're not cisgendered right folks that are either non-binary uh, gender non-conforming or trans are going to face more attacks and then of course sexual orientation anyone who's not considered heterosexual or even again this isn't even just like these people aren't and that's why they're being targeted it's a perception that they aren't and being targeted so there are people that have been victimized through these frames just because someone thought they were something that they weren't so you know when we look at the extent of this stuff it's it's really really frightening right that the southern poverty law center which tracks this stuff showed that you know basically clan chapters you know the ku klux klan chapters have grown dramatically in the last few years and that even the numbers that they have of those hate groups are most likely underestimates um, of what's actually happening in the radical right in America right now. So one study revealed that an increase in access to the internet leads to an increase in racial hate crimes. So interesting, there's no relationship to an increase in internet access to an increase in local hate group information, but there's a link with internet access in terms of racial hate crimes committed by those quote unquote lone wolf perpetrators that are posting on message boards and hate groups and being propped up and, and encouraged by these other bigots to actually go out and harm people. Okay, moving on to anti-hate crime legislation. There's a lot of them, um, though, and this is important to kind of specify and to go through each one, but again, um, this hasn't obviously really um, stopped the issue from happening, but it has um, protected more groups over time and kind of enhanced the sentencing of these crimes, meaning if we believe in deterrence, then we know that having an enhancement to a crime, like so murder is a murder, but if you murdered as a result of hating a person based on some identity, like their gender or their religion or whatever it might be, um, then you're going to get longer sentences for that in the hopes that people will not do that in the future, right? That it will deter that person from ever offending again because they'll be locked up for a long time. But it will also have that general deterrence aspect of, you know, other hateful people in the community not acting out on their prejudicial thinking. Okay, so let's go through them real quick. Like, Hate Crime Statistics Act of 1990 um, is part of the UCR, you know, Uniform Crime Report Program. The Attorney General was required to develop guidelines and collect data about crimes that, you know, are related to race, religion, all these other kind of protected categories, including where appropriate crimes of murder, uh, manslaughter, forcible rape, aggravated assault, simple assault, intimidation, arson, destruction, damage, or vandalism. So in an effort to avoid any new data reporting responsibilities for law enforcement agencies participating in the UCR, the collection of hate crime data was incorporated into the UCR. So if a traditional offense is motivated by offenders bias, the reporting agency is to complete a hate crime incident report. And that form collects information like where was it? What kind of victim was it? Um, you know, how many offenders were involved? What was the race of the offender? What was the bias motivation? Things like this. So that we can have a better sense of what's going on and why. You also have the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act of 1994, which amended Hate Crime Statistics Act to enhance penalties for offenses that involve a motivation bias. So that passed in 94. Um, into that big ass crime bill that had a lot of problems that we'll be dissecting later, but it was directing the U.S. Sentencing Commission to enhance hate crime sentences to no less than three offense levels. Um, there's also the Church Arson Prevention Act of 96, which prohibits the intentional defacement, damage, or destruction of religious property, um, and again, or the obstruction by force or threat of force of people being able to exercise their religious beliefs. So this punishment varies from one year imprisonment and a fine to death, right? Depending on the specific conditions of what was going on there. So that punishment does depend on, you know, um, whether people were killed during these incidents. Like there was the, you know, kind of famous incident in the uh, civil rights movement where, you know, the there was a church that was burned because it was predominantly black church 
and there was a few young girls that were inside and um, they lost their lives as a result of this and it's just such a tragedy an unnecessary tragedy that's motivated by hate um, and so these laws are supposed to you know hopefully prevent more of that um, the campus hate crime right to know act of 97 amended a higher education act from the past so to make sure that there was disclosure of these kind of incidents that happen on campuses so that you have to know when you're a part of that community that that's happening um, also, the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act of 2009 um, is named for two people who were killed because of who they were in very gruesome and violent ways. Um, and so the act states that it's unlawful to cause bodily injury willfully or attempt to do so with a dangerous weapon when the offense was committed because of the perceived identity. Again, perceived race, color, religion, national origin, gender, sexual orientation gender identity, disability, or any of those kind of protected factors of any person. So this act gives the FBI authority to investigate violent hate crimes, including those aimed at, you know, LGBTQ uh, community. Um, there's also model state legislation, which is, um, you know, hate crimes, violence against homeless people, um, which is the National Law Center on um, Homelessness and Poverty and the National Coalition for the Homeless advocated for legislation to protect the homeless themselves as they are often victimized um, almost for sport by people that, you know, um, basically just do not see their value or social worth. And so as a result, they are uh, assaulted or battered, killed, um, you know, or just have all of their stuff destroyed, you know, things like that. Um, crimes against them largely just because they are unhoused. So Byers and Crowder examined hate crimes against the Amish using routine activities theory. So they studied these offenders who would target Amish people in crimes that are referred to as clapping, right? That's the, that's the term for targeting Amish people. So examples include, oh, and if you don't know what Amish are, they're those folks that kind of like live off the grid without electricity, right? In some of the um, kind of middle of the country states, they like live with horse and buggies and, you know, kind of all of that off the grid stuff um, because they think, you know, technology is an evil. So anyway, because of their, you know, peculiar ways of living and their kind of, you know, unique religious belief systems, um, they are often targeted. So examples include verbal harassment, blowing up mailboxes, forcing Amish buggies off the road, with ramming them by cars or, you know, killing their animals or even spraying them with fire extinguishers. So in that research by Byers and Kreider, the qualitative data that they found supported routine activity theory that the participants, or in this case, the offenders were motivated, the Amish were considered suitable targets, and there was a perception that the guardians were absent to discourage these types of crimes. Okay, Waldner and Berg applied a revision of routine activities theory to understanding anti-gay violence. So they employed Finkelhor and Asgadian's revised routine activities theory, which includes the concept of target congruence. So target congruence is when various personal characteristics of individuals could possibly enhance their vulnerability to victimization. So those characteristics have some congruence with the needs and the motives of the offenders. So certain offenders are attracted or respond to particular types of victims or particular characteristics in victims, which make them more vulnerable. And then Plum and colleagues implemented a jury simulation model to explore different forms of victim blaming, right? So victim blaming is very problematic when it comes to trying to understand a lot of crimes, especially related to sexual assault. We have this horrible culture of what we call rape culture where we often justify sexual assault as the victim's fault instead of the offender's fault, which it clearly is, <laughs> right? Like, again, if someone comes into your house and like punches you in the face, you're like, hey, cops, this happened. But, you know, for some reason with these crimes of sexual assault, part of it is we don't believe women. We don't believe um, minorities when they say that these things happen to them, especially sexual minorities. Um, and oftentimes what's put on trial is that person and their integrity and their sexual backstory. And it becomes those kind of knee-jerk reactions we have where we'll say things like, 
well, why did you go there? Well, what were you wearing? Were you drinking? As if it's your fault you were victimized, which we don't do with other crimes. Like, again, if you're carjacked, we're not like, well, why were you driving such a nice car? What did you expect to happen? Are you sure you didn't just give the car away? Right? Like, we don't do that with other crimes. But for some reason, our culture, patriarchy, hint, patriarchy, um, tries to come up with justifications for the kind of violence that's happening and put that blame on victims themselves. So, you know, they were looking at uh, different forms of victim blaming and how that affects um, assaults that are motivated by bias against sexual orientation. And they found that there's a lot of factors to be taken into consideration by jurors in these types of cases, which again, affects the kind of justice that people can seek. Because again, if those members of the jury that are supposed to be the jury of your peers do not see your sexuality as valid or do not see you as fully human because of their own bias, that can impact the way that they understand this. And also just the perspective aspect. We all look at the world through our own social locations. So sometimes it's hard for us to inhabit the shoes of others and understand things from their perspectives. Okay, moving on to different categories of multi-side. So multi-side are just individuals who kill multiple victims. So there's under that banner, you have serial killers, mass murderers, and spree killers, which obviously are different. So we're gonna kind of jump into those specificities here. So when it comes to categories of mass murder, um, you have the disciple mass killer. So, you know, the classic case is the Charlie Manson, right? Basically, he, you know, kind of was able to, with the use of drugs and other control mechanisms, if you know anything about Charlie Manson, uh, to motivate his followers to go and kill, right? And um, so even though he was not the person who, you know, um, cast a lot of the fatal blows that, you know, caused the death of, you know, the LaBiancas and, of course, you know, uh, Sharon Tate and others, um, he was still considered you know, a criminally or liability wise guilty because he was the motivating cult leader that was again, manipulating people into committing these crimes. Um, family annihilator killers are unfortunately common in what we see nowadays. And there seems to be a really interesting connection between those kind of killers and these, um, you know, kind of mass murders that are happening a lot. Um, You'll notice if you keep an eye on the news, because again, there's often in the last several years, there's been more mass shootings than days of the year. So uh, you can't go more than but a day and, and hear about one. Um, you'll often hear about a domestic aspect of it, right? So for instance, before this person goes and shoots up a school, they kill someone close to them, like a family member or a loved one or something of that nature. So it's interesting to see how um, there is kind of a thread of connection here. But anyway, family annihilators are just people who, um, they know their victims, they're often family members, and you know um, they might also kill themselves at the end of this process. You have disgruntled employee killers, right? Where someone's just mad, they lost their job, they either blame you know someone else or something else at the job for causing that to happen, and um, they retaliate in a violent way. You have ideological mass killers, people who, you know, want to kill people who are different than them because of their, you know, perceive basically how they perceive other people's values and they think that that person's wrong, so therefore they can kill them. Um, you have disgruntled citizen killers. These are people who are angry with certain aspects of society. Again, so maybe they're going through like financial hardships or something else and they want to take it out on people that they deem to be responsible for the things that they're facing in their lives. Um, you have psychotic mass killers, which are, um, you know, psychotic, but often with schizophrenia, meaning like they are just seeing and hearing things that are not there. Like they are not medicated. They are not being treated for these things and they perceive others as being out to get them. And what's important to note here is that oftentimes we too, easily conflate uh, psychosis and, or mental illness with violence. And we have to, I really feel like there has to be a big asterisk there. It's not predictive, meaning, oh, this person has schizophrenia, so that means they might kill everyone. No, that's just not at all how that works. Uh, overwhelmingly, 
the overwhelming majority of people that have mental illness conditions, even if it is schizophrenia, are not violent. And um, so, yeah, that's often the rhetoric that we hear from the people that don't want us to talk about guns whenever there's a mass shooting. Oh, it's mental health. We just need mental health. And it's like these same folks that don't want to fund robust mental health or have universal free health care where people can seek out mental health treatment for all the conditions that they're facing, right? We can't deny that mental health is an aspect of a lot of this stuff. But I would say, you know, so is that racial bias part. There's a mental health aspect to that too. If you're some white supremacist, usually it's because you hate yourself. There's something about yourself you don't like that you feel like now you need to attach yourself to this identity to give yourself more worth to put other people down to raise yourself up. So, um, yeah, I feel like that's a mental illness as well in many ways. It's a delusion about the world that people create so that they can feel their own supremacy um, in a world where they don't have any. And I think that, um, you know, again, if we were a culture that actually cared about changing these things, not only would we reform gun policies and who has access to them, but we would definitely actually have universal health care so people can get the kind of help that they need. Okay, and then there's school killers, which is its own whole category that we'll talk about here. So, um, when it comes to school attacks, um, the Secret Service and the Department of Education really, um, you know, kind of, they looked at the Columbine attack, which again, you don't remember um, because you weren't born. Um, I remember vividly um, because, oh God, I don't want to date myself by saying exactly how old I was at that point. Let's just say I wasn't born either, but I know I, I definitely remember it. And um, it was pretty shocking, largely because it didn't fit the profile of a lot of school attacks in the past. It was kind of organized in a way. There was this, uh, the kind of targeting of certain people or certain cliques or groups. Um, and basically they've studied school attacks over 25 years up to that point. So Columbine happens in the year 2000. Um, you know, so from 1975 to 2000, they found that the vast majority of uh, school crimes were committed by one student and that the most common weapon was a handgun. But of course, in Columbine, there was more than more than one person. Um, There's a couple of them and they had assault weapons. Also, um, the study found that most attackers were socially mainstream, meaning Columbine kind of changed that where it became these, you know, outcasts, social outcasts that were, again, the trench coat mafia. Again, you don't remember any of this because you weren't born, but I'm just going to tell you as a person who, okay, yes, I was born. I was born and I was old enough to be very aware <laughs> of what was happening. And I was also in high school. Oh God, why did I just say it out loud? Maybe I'll cut that part out of the lecture. Okay. So, um, Additionally, most student attackers were receiving A's and B's in school. So the profile in the media is often that, oh, they're just bad students and that's where they're acting out, when that's just not what the data shows. Also, the Secret Service study showed that the vast majority of student attackers were from two-headed households. So it wasn't about, oh, a disorganization of the family and that's what's causing it, though that was um, kind of part of the factors related to Columbine. Also, it's notable in the 25 year examination that they looked at, most of the incidents didn't target their peers. They were they were targeting administrators and teachers, right? Versus nowadays, um, the kinds of uh, violent school attacks that happen are often more targeted towards peers than, than authority figures. And um, basically none of those attacks in 25 years were stopped by law enforcement. Rather, it was by intervention of teachers and other staff, because again, oftentimes, it only they only have a few minutes for those things to to respond um but again we've seen very different things there right like what did we see in uvalde in uh you know what was that 2022 i believe um you saw you know police officials showed up at the school and the shooter was inside of the school and they did not go in and they stood outside for a very very long time you had parents like one woman very famously was detained by police because she tried to get in the building to get her child. And then she basically broke out of her cuffs, went in there, got her kid out. Um, and all the while police were sitting on their hands. There's been a lot of firings, a lot of, you know, 
uh, people in those areas, you know, trying to call for justice and new training and new programming. But on site, there was a person that was trained that was in charge of that, that should have known how to intervene. Um, but they were afraid of taking on fire themselves. So they left the kids in there uh, to deal with these issues themselves. So, um, you know, this is a huge, huge problem, um, especially as it's now younger and younger children that are being targeted. And oftentimes, you know, the kind of drills that happen in school have just become normal, that we should ask kindergartners and first graders to learn how to hide and fight and run from a mass shooter. It's, it's a horrible reality that just doesn't really take place in other countries and it definitely not at the scale that we see it here. Yes, there are other mass casualty events in other countries that are schools. Yes, there are other shootings in other countries that are at schools, but not anywhere near the levels that happen here. So we have to ask ourselves in a sociological focus, what's going on with our culture that this is happening? Why is it that so many kids are bringing guns to school? How are they gaining access to them, right? Why do they feel like that's their only way to deal with whatever perceived issue they're dealing with? So, um, and this is from every level. This is like literally to the point of people have gone to elementary schools as we saw with, you know, um, Parkland and, um, you know, Yavaldi, you have, um, you know, Newtown, you have all of these horrible, you know, high schools like Marjorie Stoneman Douglas and a lot of other high profile ones, um, and colleges as well. So this is basically at every level of education. Now we have to worry about the safety of children within schools because of the fact that these attacks are so prevalent. And again, culturally, why? Okay, so um, when we look at multicide, we also see disparities in rates of committing multicide across race and religious ideology. So recent studies have noted that it's a common myth that African Americans are underrepresented as multicide offenders, especially for serial killers, right? We tend to think like, oh no, it's just like white folks, because I think maybe we just watch a lot of criminal minds and we see some of that stuff. Um, but about approximately 20% of all serial killers are black. Um, so percentage-wise in the population that kind of tracks um, and a recent review of data on mass murderers in the U.S. has, you know, really shown that only one out of 207 incidents, you know, by 2015 were actually committed by known Muslim offenders, even though since 9-11, um, there has been a much higher suspicion towards anyone that's considered, you know, Muslim or maybe even just Middle Eastern, that they might be a terrorist suspect. Um, but according to the FBI data, 94% of terrorist attacks carried out in the U.S. from 1980 to 2005, so including that time period of 9-11, were committed by non-Muslims, 94%. So again, it's sometimes our, our racialized perceptions and the rhetoric and the hatred that happens within the culture affects our perceptions of the realities of what's actually happening. So that's a decent segue into terrorism. So what is terrorism? There's definitionally, there's not a clear and concise definition here. In one respect, it's a social construct, meaning that it's a term that's defined through a social and cultural practice. So we have varying definitions of this term, right? So it's kind of a pejorative that's been used. It has, you know, extremely negative associations and denotes death and destruction. So society is constantly exposed to the term by the news media, by politicians, by you know, popular entertainment venues, and it's applied to varieties of actors, conditions, activities, and situations. So as a social construct, the term is used to demonize people, society, and actions. So Bruce Hoffman um, identified terrorism as inevitable political in aims and motives, violent or threats of violence, designed to have far-reaching psychological consequences beyond the immediate victim or target. And often this is conducted by an organization with an identifiable chain of command at, or perpetrated by a subnational, sub I don't know why that wouldn't come out of my mouth, a group or non-state entity. So when we look at this, um, you know, in the ways that it's, it's understood um, through government agencies, you know, there are different definitions as well of terrorism that have evolved over time 
as different parts of the State Department have kind of tried to deal with this, right? So I think that's less clear than looking at the typologies that have been developed by Gus Martin. Um, you know, kind of looking at what motivates the action as a way to kind of distinguish what kind of terrorism we're looking at. So state-sponsored terrorism are terrorist acts that transpire due to the guidance of the state or government against perceived enemies. So targets of this type of terrorism may include politicians, political parties, or groups within the host country, or those in other countries. So, um, you know, for example, uh, I think a, a good example of that could be um, you have, like, Putin, pretty much anyone that stands up against him, like, falls out of a window or drinks some poison. And the U.S. State Department has identified, you know, some countries that they consider to be state sponsors of terrorism, though, fun fact, kind of leaning back on conflict theory perspective, they would point out, you know, a lot of those countries think we are too. Because if you look at the history of the United States, like, for instance, um, funding El Salvadorian death squads um, so the United Fruit Company could have better, you know, basically return on their investment for bananas. Um, you know, what happened in Chile about 50 years ago when um, the democratic socialist leader uh, Salvador Allende was um, taken out in a coup and a, um, you know, murdered in his palace and then uh, basically uh, replaced by a dictator that ruled for many years, Pinochet, um, that was, you know, backed by the U.S. So again, I, I'm not saying these other states aren't also causing state-sponsored terrorism, because of course that's, that's still the case. It's just that we can't look at other countries and what they do with also then having a blind spot for what happens in our country and what we're doing. Okay, sorry, rant over. Um, dissident terrorism involves terrorist activities against the government that are committed by rebellious groups. So these groups are often, you know, they're trying to do these terrorist acts for power, for wealth, or control. Um, so an example there could be a dissident action would be storming the Capitol on January 6th, trying to prevent the peaceful transfer of power uh, from one administration to the next, to basically steal an election in a democratic country. Um, thankfully, that's not what happened but we got way closer than we ever should have. Religious terrorism is motivated by engaging in terrorist acts that are legitimized by religious dogma, which again, I don't know how you get your religion to warp around to, it's okay to murder people, as like God says so. Um, but again, the religious terrorism has been used for as long as there's been religion, right? If you think about many, many historical high profile things you've learned about at some point. Um, were motivated by this kind of religious philosophy that says, um, you know, that you should destroy someone else to preserve your own religion or, or promote your own religion. And of course, we look at this as, you know, the kind of recent uh, decades of how, you know, religious philosophy has motivated this, like they talk about, you know, suicide bombers or things like that that happen in certain countries. Um, but again, you can look at the Spanish Inquisition as an example of that. Um, or certain aspects of past colonialism going into areas and forcing people to not practice their religious beliefs and forcing them to learn the religious beliefs of the people colonizing them. Um, and then criminal terrorism are just motivated by engaging criminal activity for profits. So the example they give in the text is um, the drug cartels in Mexico. So the violence that they cause is beyond the people that they're actually harming. They're trying to discourage anyone else from messing with them. So I'm sure if you keep, you know, uh, context of that stuff, you've heard about, you know, um, the kind of like school buses of people that have disappeared um, or, you know, been taken ransom by cartels or all of these horrible situations, mass graves that they've uncovered. Like when they were trying to search for this one particular group, um, they must have unearthed like maybe four or five other mass graves that once they did DNA testing, they found those were not those people that they were still searching for which just stands to reason that it's like pretty terrifying to see how many people are really, you know, being killed through the system and why to prop up the power of the cartels to, um, you know, anyone that's challenging them or might have information that could harm them. They're, you know, targeting. And, um, 
obviously targeting efforts at reforming that system. Okay, so when we look at the extent, um, a major resource to understanding the extent of it is the Global Terrorism Index, which is a wide-ranging study that collects information on terrorism from 162 countries. And their, 200, or their 2015 report found that terrorist activity increased 80% from 2014. So number of deaths from terrorism in 2013 was 18,111, while in 2014 it was 32,681. So currently the deadliest terrorist group in the world is Boko Haram. And while deaths attributed to, you know, the uh, ISIL or ISIL um, are, were about 6,000 or so, um, there were about 6,600 attributed to Boko Haram. So terrorist activity is highly concentrated. About five countries in the world account for 78% of those deaths. So you have um, places of instability, hint, hint, uh, where the war on terrorism has taken place, hint, Iraq, uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, and Nigeria. So the number of private citizens being killed due to terrorist attacks has increased dramatically. And terrorist attacks on religious targets has actually declined in the research for the book. So two groups are responsible for half of all deaths of terrorism. Um, Boko Haram and ISIL, or you know what they used to call ISIS, but again, the, the specific acronym has changed slightly. Um, so it's pretty crazy to think that just those two groups have attributed about 51% of what they found within the research. Okay, so... Um, when you're looking at, you know, the more historical context of this stuff, um, terrorism is a type of political warfare. So, you know, obviously how the motivations of terrorism change, um, it re remains kind of consistent that it happens. So the first known terrorist group um, was literally in AD uh, 66 to 73, right? A group of... Um, extremist religious zealots who tried to banish Romans and their Jewish collaborators. So, I mean, literally back to like some of the most ancient of history, we can already see these issues happening. So um, during the 11th century, you had Shiite Muslim sects that killed politicians and clerics who didn't adhere to their forms of Islam. That's another historical example. Of course, the French Revolution, right? Uh, if you know anything about the French Revolution, it was, you know, the the kind of um, surf class rising up, cutting off the heads of the, the gentry. And then, of course, the group that then took over power during the reign of terror, um, they themselves had their heads cut off. It was a lot of it was a lot of guillotining. Right. But basically, the regime was intended to merge the power of the revolutionary, the new revolutionary government, as well as protect it from what was considered subversive factors. So. In that sense, terrorism was considered positive, right? Because basically they were upending a system of control that basically kept, you know, the royals and the lords and the ladies and all the kind of other gentry with their, you know, foot on the throat of the serfs and, you know, those those folks who served them, basically. And the idea that came out of it, you know, freedom, liberty, brotherhood, all this kind of crap, uh, really affected the... Um, the kind of formation of our country and some of our laws and all that stuff that we spoke about a couple chapters back when we were talking about the influence of some of those enlightenment thinkers that came out of that time period. Okay, so then you move to the late 19th and early 20th century. So from the 1800s into the early 1900s, anarchists and socialists were responsible for some terrorism. You know, they liked to bomb stuff. Um, they, because they were advocating for the rights of the working class and trying to counter the, uh, you know, government centralized control of private property. So most of the acts involving anarchists and socialists were directed towards those who were perceived as supporters of the oppressive government. So they weren't just like killing indiscriminately. They were doing it for a specific kind of political end or cause. Um, and so terrorist acts during that period have been termed, you know, state sponsored as well. After World War II, there was a shift in terrorist activity that moved from uh, Europe to kind of more of their colonies of Europe. So there was more resistance and national movements. 
that basically were people trying to stop being colonized. They didn't want to be controlled anymore. So these nationalist and anti-colonial groups were often involved in what, what's called guerrilla warfare. So basically, you know, they don't want to be controlled. They don't want all of their resources to be taken out of their countries and sent to Europe so that Europe can be rich and powerful. So um, they often had to resort to violent activities or violent motivations to try to wrench that control away. During the 60s and 70s, there were some groups that engaged in terrorist activities that increased. Um, and these groups expanded to not only nationalists, but those who were motivated by ethnic or ideological issues as well. So, you know, you have like the IRA, uh, the PLO, you know, some of these kind of famous ones in that time period. Um, or even sometimes people refer to that as like, you know, like the Weather Underground or those kind of groups, which I still feel like they don't really hit that same measure because they're not, you know, um, murdering people as much. I think there was one person that died as, as a result of a Weather Underground bombing by accident, but they typically would target like government buildings or, or things that had some symbolic power because um, they were trying to combat like the kind of war machine that was happening at the time with Vietnam. Um, because they were the young people being drafted and put into these wars. So anyway, um, they they were more about targeting strategically, you know, ideologically in a different way. But anyway, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm just taking up your time. Okay, let's move on. Like I told you, this could literally be its own whole class. There's way too much information here to just cram into a tiny little nutshell. But that's what we're doing. So contemporary terrorism. Since 9-11... Uh, terrorism has had not just an influence on the U.S., but in an international stage. Obviously, a lot of emphasis has focused on Al-Qaeda. Um, you know, and as Gus Martin would say, that the modern world is challenged by this new terrorism, which is characterized loosely as, um, you know, cell-based networks that have minimal lines of command and control that have desired acquisition of high-intensity weapons and weapons of mass destruction. And they're kind of politically vague, religious, mystical motivations. So he then compares that with traditional terrorism that's characterized by a clearly identifiable organization or movement, use of conventional weapons, explicit grievances, and relatively surgical selection of targets versus, you know, um, just kind of indiscriminate killings. So um, in the current context of, of terrorism, there's organizational networks that we have to kind of understand. So Jonathan White provided an overview of how terrorist organization structures have changed over time. The traditional organization was comprised of cells. Groups of cells were formed into what they call columns. So members in the cells rarely know each other. The idea being that if one person is caught or if they die, um, you know, they're not going to destroy the kind of hierarchy of it. They're not going to be able to actually name names or point fingers because they don't know the other people involved that well. So the organizational structure was modified soon after to be more of a pyramid, either large or small. And the pyramids represent a hierarchical nature of the group with the passive and active supporters at the base and the active cadre of command at the top. So during the 80s, a new organizational structure developed from that pyramid the first structural change was umbrella organizations. So this organizational structure, you have numerous small pyramids that are assembled under one sheltering group. And the sheltering group is what manages the supplies, gets resources, uh, support structure, and gets the information that those then individual umbrellas work on. So the umbrella organization itself is disconnected with those terrorist activities or disconnected from each other, but they still kind of serve under that same umbrella. Um, in the 90s, the RAND Corporation identified other types of new organizational structures. So one is virtual organizations, right? This is, you know, through communication, financial, or ideological links. And so these kind of organizations have no central leadership. Another kind of uh, structure that the RAND Corporation identified was um, chain organizations, which are temporary associations with various groups that will gather for a specific operation or a specific purpose, and then once that's achieved, they disperse. And then lastly, there's hub organizations that are established to manage or support the cells. So in a way, they function kind of similarly to those umbrella groups. So uh, essential tool to fighting terrorism is restricting the financial 
um, assets of these organizations. Like obviously cut off the money, you cut off the ability to deal with this stuff. So limiting financial resources can result in obviously um, creating a situation where the leader doesn't have as much power. Um, it can affect morale, legitimacy, and of course strategic complications because you can't really attack without all the money that you need. Um, this is something we talk about a lot when it comes to like the cartels themselves, right? So money laundering is often a process by which funds obtained through illegal activities are cleansed. And um, this is kind of one of those ways that sometimes um, illegal money, you know, can become legitimate, right? And the idea here is, um, oh, I don't even have to give you like a hypothetical, like SBCC or whatever it is, that big bank. I think that's the initials. I can't remember right now. Sorry. Sorry, my brain. I don't have enough caffeine. But anyway, um, major bank, they were implicated, what, like a decade ago of money laundering for the cartels. So the Mexican cartels would go to this major Wall Street bank, hand them, you know, duffel bags full of money that was coming from illicit activities, and they would basically take the money, put it into other funds and, and sources to try to legitimize that money. Um, so that's a, typically a three-step process. And of course, oh, here's the other thing. The bank, how did they get punished when it was found out that they were doing this? They had to pay like a couple million dollar fine, which is like less than one day's operating profit. So, um, yeah, it's incredibly problematic how much the banks and the banking system themselves around internationally support terrorist organizations and terrorist networks by um, giving them a place to store their funds. So this is something we should care about. Um, OK, so typically money laundering is a three step process. The illegal money is placed into some sort of financial system. The money is layered processed through the system, usually, you know, putting it into other funds or sources so that it kind of blends in. And then that money is turned and reintegrated into legitimate economy. Um, fundraising is another way that um, people have been able to finance terrorist organizations. So, for instance, like the IRA, the Irish Republic Army, used that method for decades to fund their attacks in Northern Ireland and England, um, largely because, again, Ireland is like a colony of England and for many years was trying to resist being absorbed by England, still is. And um, anyway, that's so obviously they were they were being motivated through the kind of like charitable donations that people were giving them. Um, charity fundraising was also used by Osama bin Laden with Al Qaeda. Um, so this is one of those things like we have to be cognizant of people that are, you know, collecting money and channeling it to terrorist groups. Okay, um, influence of the media. So much of what we know about terrorism is through the media and that can be problematic, right? Because sometimes we're not seeing the full scope of stuff. So Simon Connell identified various communication frames that are used to report on terrorism. So the first reporting frames are typically short and blended with facts. Some dominant frames are from one authority's viewpoint, so that can impact the way that we kind of an interpret or understand these issues. Um, conflict frames consist of two perspectives where you're saying, okay, you know, here's why, here's what's motivating their actions, what grievance they're going through. And then of course, still pointing out that what they're doing is wrong, right? Like even if you're being oppressed or marginalized, it's not okay to then just wield that violence against your oppressor. But that's again, um, it, the way that the media reports on these things is going to color our ability to accurately perceive what we're looking at and to kind of, you know, um, understand, you know, like for instance, if um, we only allow the state itself to use violence against citizens, but not citizens to use against the state. And when citizens do use that violence against the state, they are, you know, incredibly violently repressed. Um, you know, sometimes we can see that there might be a larger issue at play within the actual state itself. Anyway, so um, investigative frames can help us expose you know, corrupt and illegal behavior, which can help us fix these issues. Um, but oftentimes the framing is going to be more in the, in a way of um, quick, cumulative. It doesn't really tell us the full scope of what's going on or the full backstory. Um, if it's a community service frame, it provides information to the public so they know what's going on. Um, there's also co collective interest frames that reinforce the common values and viewpoints that can kind of say, you know, 
um, what we consider right and wrong because these things we think they're static but actually these are kind of ongoing definitional negotiations over time that we engage in as a community. So cultural recognition also frames a sort of you know reflection on a group's values and norms and sometimes we have these mythic tales frames that consist of hero stories or people that have you know kind of um, done these actions for what's considered you know um, some sort of passion or greater good in their mind so Jonathan White also outlined some of the issues associated with the media and reporting these issues and often it centers on whether the media presents the information unbiased or in an objective manner which it rarely does and another issue is the contention effect so this refers to whether media coverage of a terrorist incident inspires more terrorism right like shining a light on this stuff so people say the same issue with um, a lot of mass shootings is the way we're covering this stuff actually emboldening more people to then go do it so the issue of censorship is also raised when individuals assume the terrorist acts are influenced by irresponsible media coverage and this coverage can provide terrorists with that information um domestic terrorism is a huge one in our modern era see january 6th so the Federal Bureau of Investigation has defined domestic terrorism as having these characteristics involving acts dangerous to human life that violate federal or state law, appear intended to intimidate or coerce a civilian population to influence policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, aka take over the capital, to affect the conduct of government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping, like that that group of uh, supremacists that wanted to, they got caught before they did it by the FBI, but they were planning and training, they were doing training exercises to try to um, kidnap Gretchen Whitmer, the governor, Gretchen Whitmer, um, so that, because again, they just disagreed with her political stances, um, so they wanted to take her hostage and kill her as a result of that. Thankfully, the FBI caught that before it happened. Um, and these, to, to, for it to be domestic terrorism, it just means that it happens within the U.S., so the FBI contends that domestic terror threat ranges from white supremacists to eco-terrorists to violent prone anti-government extremists to radical separatist groups. Now, I personally take a lot of offense to the idea that someone that's videotaping um, downed cows being forced in by, uh, by uh, forklifts into a facility when that's supposed to be illegal, I, I still just don't understand that as domestic terrorism. I don't understand protests at Cop City as domestic terrorism, but there's actually a case of, you know, people being charged with domestic terrorism for protesting um, Cop City in Atlanta. If you haven't heard of that, just Google Cop City and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but, you know, he's saying, Gus is saying that uh, political violence is a left-right issue, um, which again, I just don't know if I really agree with that in the same way. People protesting the construction of a several hundred acre facility where cops can practice drilling to shoot folks um, is not necessarily the same as like white supremacists trying to take over the capital or trying to you know uh, take the governor and kill them oftentimes when you look at the kind of quote-unquote left terrorism they'll say like labor activism or for instance um the indigenous water protectors fighting against Keystone XL and the Dakota Access Pipeline. Are they domestic terrorists when they storm the, the fence and they get in the way of production um, so that, you know, um, they can't create more pipelines that cause more climate change and ecological destruction to watersheds and other, like, important resources? So anyway, um, <laughs> it's really interesting to see how they're often just kind of levied as the same versus right-wing terrorism is often motivated by racial supremacy, anti-government viewpoints. You have like the Bundy Ranch folks that shot at those federal authorities. You have, um, you know, basically the Oklahoma City bombing, like blowing up an entire building um, based on, you know, hateful anti-government white supremacist logic. And the FBI says that these are the crimes that are on the rise. These are the ones that we should be looking out for um, especially within the confines of the U.S., but again, we're so focused on on international terrorism. We're not often looking at the stuff that's happening within our, the confines of our own country, especially motivated by, 
you know, racism, hatred, um, and moralist terrorism, right? The idea of like killing people because they aren't heterosexual or they aren't the same religion as you. Um, and that's, you know, very, um, unfortunately, like one group, for example, that they talk about in the book is the army of God, right? Is what they call themselves. Um, which is just disgusting to anyone who has any religious ideology that someone would use the name of God to do these atrocities, but hence that's what it is. So it's interesting to see how, um, while these things are characterized one way or the other, um, you have to look at who's being harmed and what is the intent of the action. If the intent of the action is to literally create an ethno-racial state where only white people have power versus create a situation where animals aren't abused, or create a situation where um, hundreds of acres of beautiful land is not turned into a playground for uh, military-style policing, or things like that. Um, you just kind of have to look at the motivations there, I think, to really suss out some of that stuff for your own interpretations. Okay, um, looking more at the theoretical explanations of terrorism. So you have Brian Forrest identified three general barriers to understanding terrorism. While terrorism cases are similar with respect to having political motive, there's numerous differences. In most instances, terrorists are, unlike other criminals, tend to engage in unpredictable activities. So compared to other types of crime, terrorism is difficult to analyze because there's a relatively small amount of reliable data on cases. So it doesn't have, it doesn't give us enough information for statistical inferences so that we can be predictive about saying, oh, in this situation, this might happen. Um, that's just not the case. Another theoretical model that enhances our understanding is game theory which is an analytic approach that assesses various scenarios by playing a, applying a simulation kind of gaming model. So the goal is basically to understand why the people, or in this case the players, um, are behaving the way that they are in their kind of competitive situation. And the second goal is to advise the players the best ways to play. Okay, moving on to Homeland Security. So when 9-11 happened, it was clear that the U.S. was vulnerable to these kinds of attacks and really ill-equipped to prevent them. So um, on October 8th, 2001, uh, President George W. Bush issued Executive Order 13228, establishing the Office of Homeland Security and the Homeland Security Council. So the initial responsibility of the Office of Homeland Security was to produce the first national strategy for Homeland Security in 2002. And the strategy was to address, you know, what does it do? Uh, what is it trying to accomplish? You know, it's a now an executive branch. Like, how should it be used in the future? And what should non-federal governments, private sector, and citizens do to help secure that? So it was created, this Office of Homeland Security was created. Um, again, it was defined as a concerted national effort to prevent terrorist attacks within the U.S., reduce Americans' vulnerability to terrorism, and minimize the damage and recovery from attacks that do occur. So this all kind of comes back to the issue of blowback, right? When 9-11 happened, a lot of people were like, what? There's people around the world that are mad at us? And you're like, yeah, you have to basically have your head in the sand to not understand that the U.S. intervenes in countries all over the world. And that doesn't win hearts and minds, right? A lot of people don't like when you bomb their country for 30 years. So um, that is the kind of situation that the U.S. is in as an imperialistic power. Um, there are going to be situations where people want to harm the U.S., um, you know, largely as a symbol, as that colonizing symbol. So the goal of Homeland Security, again, was to prevent um, or disrupt terrorist attacks, and they've been pretty successful at doing this. Like, there have been a number of, like, like just even, for example, the Governor Gretchen Whitmer kind of thing, the preventing terrorist attacks from taking place um, by embedding themselves within some of these networks, catching some of the stuff before it actually spirals. I mean, that's kind of the whole thing with George W. Bush, right? A lot of people say that um, there was some blame there because there was a report that was handed to him, you know, before 9-11 happened, talking about bin Laden being, um, you know, determined to strike within the U.S., but there wasn't really a mechanism like Homeland Security at the time to to kind of respond to that. Okay, um, so definitions of Homeland Security, again, they have their own ways that they define um, terrorism, right? That they're basically looking at, um, 
or well, I'll just read you their, their definition is, Homeland Security is a concerted national effort by federal, state, and local governments, by the private sector, and by individuals to prevent terrorist attacks within the United States, reduce America's vulnerability to terrorism, and minimize the damage and recover from attacks. So they're looking at, you know, kind of all hazards there, whether it's man-made or natural disasters, to kind of respond and recover from incidents that occur. So Homeland Security is what the department of, or that department of it, is supported by federal agencies. So again, that's kind of where it's getting the, the staffing, the financial support from. Um, it, it can mean different things in different jurisdictions, so that can make it very complicated when other forms of law enforcement. Um, also, again, it's a national effort, so um, that, that can also be difficult to manage. Um, so, you know, Homeland Security is trying to deal with national security, which of course there's other organizations that also deal with that. Um, but it's the ways in which they're focusing specific on, specifically on, um, terrorism or, you know, um, those aspects that kind of make them a little bit different. And, um, it's really kind of a symbol now to justify government efforts to curtail civil liberties. So, um, 11 days after 9-11, uh, you have Pennsylvania Governor Tom Ridge appointed the first director of the Office of Homeland Security. And um, November 2002, Congress passed the Homeland Security Act, resulting in the DHA being its own standalone cabinet-level department. Now it's in the bureaucracy. So, um, you know, different agencies are responsible for Homeland Security. You have um, Transportation Security Administration, so the TSA, those folks that make you take off your shoes and don't let you bring any lotion in with you. Why? Because it might be a plastic explosive, right? And so that's why they make you dump out all that crap. Um, you also have the U.S. Custom and Border Protection, or CBP. Um, they're part of DHS as well, because they're focusing obviously on the border or people coming into the country through flights. Um, you have U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, INS, right, um, Immigration and Nationalization Service, under this kind of banner. Um, but again, it's now called the, I should say, I should have clarified, it's now called the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service, but it's known for its previous name as, as INS, basically, right? They're responsible for immigration and naturalization adju adjudication functions, so again, some people, um, it can be giving them an immigrant visa. For other people, it can be um, giving them asylum and refugee applications. And for others, it's for its deportation. Um, part of that as well is the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So those are slightly different slices of the same pie there. So that's ICE. I'm sure you've heard of that as well. It was kind of created by merging the law enforcement branch of the Naturalization Service the intelligence and investigation sections of the former custom services, as well as U.S. Federal Protective Services. So ICE's responsibility goes beyond the border itself. And part of their strategic plan includes preventing terrorism and improving security to protect the borders against illicit trade, travel, and finance, and protect the borders through enhanced interior immigration enforcement. So um, another... Uh, kind of branch of that bureaucracy would be this U.S. Secret Service, which was created in 1865. I'm sure you heard of them. They're those folks that basically like hang out with the president so they don't get shot. It was all because of uh, President William McKinley in 1901. He was assassinated. And so um, the Secret Service were like, okay, we're responsible. We need to protect the president. In 1984, Congress passed legislation to make the fraudulent use of credit and debit cards a federal violation. So the Secret Service also deals with the Treasury and some of those financial crimes, which is pretty interesting as well. So under the Patriot Act in 2001, the Secret Service is authorized to investigate fraud and other similar activities related to computer fraud. So the mission of the Secret Service is to safeguard the nation's financial infrastructure and payment systems to preserve the integrity of the economy, protect national leaders, visiting heads of state and government, designated sites and national special security events. And then you have the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, you've heard of them. They're the one that shows up when like disasters happen and try to give out disaster relief funds. So FEMA became part of DHS in 2003 
And their whole thing is, again, just trying to help uh, different communities rebound after catastrophic events, whether that be, you know, a hurricane or whether that be a terrorist attack. Um, the U.S. Coast Guard, you know, they are um, the only military organization within the DHS. And um, their Homeland Security roles are really about protecting the ports and, um, you know, basically making sure that like drugs and weapons and weapons of mass destruction and stuff like that are not coming in through the waters around the country. Um, so they also, you know, basically protect against uh, destructive uh, practices against like marine resources as well and respond to oil and hazardous spills, stuff like that as well. Um, so some of the problems and solutions though come with more of this bureaucracy is that, you know, there can be conflicting political interests that predominate these organizations and then they can kind of conflict with each other. I mean, the White House and Congress have significant oversight responsibilities as well as authority over the DHS and there's approximately 80 committees and subcommittees in the House and Senate that have some form of oversight responsibilities regarding Homeland Security. So, again, some have said, okay, well, that's kind of an issue. Obviously, we do need oversight, right? We can't just let these huge agencies, like, police everything and not have any sort of accountability for them. But if the only <laughs> major accountability we have is Congress, which is, you know, super great at doing stuff, um, it can be problematic in its kind of bureaucracy. Um, another thing is, again, just the ways in which these organizations were kind of rapidly put together caused issues of trying to define where one ended when another one began and jurisdictional stuff. Um, also, there's issues related to civil liberties. So, you know, Gus Martin highlighted the issues concerning whether counter-terrorist methods of torture should be used on terrorist suspects. So on one side of the issue, people say, well, torture's historically been bad. Like, historically, the U.S. has said torture's bad both morally and also just like it doesn't net good information. Like, let's be completely real. If someone tortures you, you'll just say whatever for them to stop the torture, right? So, you know, um, some people, though, argued that during a war on terrorism, they needed to consider what is the definition of torture. And this is like really, again, getting into the weeds of you're too young to remember the Bush administration um, and the ways in which they kind of manipulated how we understand this stuff. So for instance, um, in a war, we have kind of international laws pertaining to how you deal with um, prisoners of war, right? So, but during this time period, um, during the beginning of the advent of the war on terror, which is kind of like an ongoing, never stopping, constant war with the globe, um, you had this, this term enemy combatant that was created that basically just says, kind of in any sense, uh, well, this person isn't a prisoner of war, they're an enemy combatant, and therefore they don't fit the Geneva criteria, so we don't have to, um, you know, treat them in ways that are ethical. So, um, you know, like, where's the line? Like, how much coercion is okay? Is shocking people, like connecting a car battery to someone's genitals, is that okay to get information? Is it okay to hang people upside down in stress positions? Or as we saw in Abu Ghraib, get people naked, put them in a big pile um, just to degrade them? Um, again, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not objective on something like this. I obviously think torture is wrong and should be illegal and is something that internationally is definitely frowned upon. And yet, you know, the U.S. torture report came out outlining how we engage in all of this in not just Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay, but a lot of black sites. Uh, basically, these places that are like not listed to where they are, where people were disappeared to for many years, often without a long pretext of why or what they actually did. And some of the kind of methodological issues of how did they find these people that were supposedly terrorists were sometimes just, they would drop leaflets or flyers into an area saying, do you know a terrorist? Turn them in. And then someone calls a number and says, hey, that guy over there, I don't like him. He's a terrorist. And then they disappear. And then they're tortured until they net some sort of information. So there's people that have been cleared to be released from this kind of detention for many years and still don't because of the kind of political aspect of it. And it really goes back to that power of the institution again. Like if you go into a mental institution, people will assume that you're crazy. 
So it's a similar kind of thing in this way. Once you've been claimed to be a terrorist, you must be a terrorist, right? It's kind of the power of the institution to define you. Shouldn't we consider waterboarding torture? It is torture. It's basically this idea where you basically simulate drowning to a person. You get them to the edge of where they feel like they're drowning and then let them breathe and then do it all over again. Um, sexual degradation was common where they, you know, make prisoners perform sexual acts or again, put them in stress positions, which means that you're like really uncomfortable and in painful positions for extended periods of time. So like for instance, um, having you bend towards your knees and then putting your arms behind you, like under through your legs and then chaining that through, um, you know, the wall. And then basically you're just bent and having your shoulders pulled upright and kind of out of socket for hours or most of your day. Um, creating a chronic state of fear, um, like people that have gone through these things, especially Guantanamo and other places talk about how they bring in dogs to like basically nip at them and bite them and bark right into their faces. Um, environmental stress. So like, um, having the lights on all the time, having really loud, uh, you know, things of sound to just like disrupt people so that they can't sleep. They don't know uh, whether it's night or day, the disorientation that that causes to the brain and sensory deprivation, meaning completely removing light or sound or completely just shoving light and sound in many ways. So he, you know, um, Martin says that, you know, policymakers still disagree about these things, but, you know, these things should be considered torture. So this issue came to the forefront, of course, with Abu Ghraib. And the only reason that it came to the forefront was because the pictures came out and people saw it. People wouldn't have cared and they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have taken it seriously if they didn't see the pictures of what was happening. And it wasn't just that people were being like horribly treated. It was the way that the soldiers were like, again, Google it, the way they were cavalierly like smiling and taking thumbs up photos with like piles of naked detainees. It's disgusting. And again, if anything, talk about terrorist fundraising how much fundraising do you think terrorists made off of that like the u.s literally doing these horrific things to people that are in their detention right like how does that not just then motivate more people to commit terrorism it just doesn't make sense so anyway um so this really comes back to human rights the United Nations has defined the nature of human rights as universal values and legal guarantees that protect individuals against actions or omissions primarily by government agents that infringe upon their fundamental freedoms, entitlements, as well as human dignity. So these human rights includes respect for, protection of, and fulfillment of civil, cultural, economic, political, and social rights, as well as the right to development. So there's two controversial areas involving the intersection of human rights with terrorism and homeland security. The first is that terrorist attacks on innocent people violate the human rights of people to exist apart from violence. And the second is that governments have to recognize the human rights of their adversaries. So even if someone did engage in that terrorist activity, does that justify doing horrible torture against them? Again, it kind of goes back to that retributive versus restorative justice, right? Do we want a better world or do we want to really punish this person? And even then, again, you have to look at the situation where a lot of people were being swept into the system without a lot of credible evidence that they actually had any real involvement. So the kind of undue harm that's being placed on so many people and so many people that have been fully exonerated, um, but spent years being tortured. Um, obviously that would definitely change my perspective of the United States if I went through something like that. So we also talk about the Constitution within this rhetoric, right? That these fundamental rights are being challenged by these new policies that address terrorism. So the fundamental rights to presumption of innocence, the right to counsel, the right to confront a witness against you, the right of a trial. I mean, a lot of these people that are in these detention facilities, and I, and I say are in because there's still some of these open and operating right now, um, they, a lot of them were never charged with a crime, right? Or just weren't given access to real legal counsels, all sorts of stuff that really violates what we understand as the constitution. Especially because, fun fact, the constitution isn't supposed to just apply to naturalized American citizens. It's supposed to be anyone within American soil, whether that be, you know, um, kind of 
the mainland America or any of its kind of colonial counterparts. So anyway, um, obviously, it's a fundamental foundational principle of American government, and a lot of people argue that the U.S. Patriot Act of 2001 undermines this by, for instance, um, collecting communications and information data. Um, so, for instance, like, because of this, we have the NSA, the National Security Agency, and they were found to have been just gathering everyone's information, like everybody's, like your phone, my phone, um, intelligence on, on international groups, on their leaders, on all of these kind of things, basically just having a huge net that they were casting and trying to weed through that, which again, violates a lot of the kind of uh, Fourth Amendment protections of the Constitution. So it's interesting, this kind of punched a little hole within that understanding in our culture. So there's been a lot of controversy about, especially the provisions that allow for intelligence gathering and sharing, because it encroaches upon civil freedoms that are protected by the Bill of Rights. So um, it's interesting that in 2011, Obama approved a four-year extension of the expiring provisions of the Patriot Act, which again, included those roving wiretaps, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, it's part of that is that Obama was, you know, very well known for um, lots of drone attacks, right? And this is actually under Obama was the first time that a U.S. citizen without charge or trial was killed um, by the state in another country by a drone attack. Um, again, largely um, completely outside of the, the understanding of the Constitution, which is very problematic for someone like Obama, who like was a constitutional law scholar. So it's not like he doesn't know how that works, but he also understands that this law supersedes some of those protective factors of the Constitution. What should have happened under the traditional Constitution would be that that person would be detained and then brought to justice in a court of law, which is, again, a whole nother thing we get into with other communities that are targeted like you know such as um a lot of people that are killed um in in encounters with police right in the same way that like you shouldn't be executed um for a crime um like for instance like the george floyd situation if you know the context of what he was supposedly doing wrong when he was being detained by police it was supposedly he had a, a counterfeit 20 dollars bill which is usually not a death sentence in this country Right. So in the similar kind of vein, um, you know, just having those kind of networks all over the world where a, you know, missiles attached to a drone can pop into any area and just blow people off the face of the map. And again, the U.S. government says, well, the the amount of enemy combatants that are being killed, you know, is very much the focus. And there's not a lot of other civilian deaths. But the fun fact of that is a lot of the ways that they classify civilian deaths is that any boy who's a teenager is considered an enemy combatant. So that messes up the kind of statistical understanding that we have to actually fully measure these things in a more objective way that's not getting pulled into that rhetoric. So um, again, that's not, it's gonna, it will continue to be an issue with civil liberties as, you know, Homeland Security continues in our culture. Okay, some of the policy implications. Oof. Okay, this is fun. You got the table 15.6, the pro and con arguments on gun control in the book. I mean, you're living in this society. You make your own decision. The people that are against gun control say the Second Amendment is there to protect individual gun ownership. But what's interesting about that, and again, don't take my word for it. Google it. Look it up. Research stuff. Read things. Um, what's interesting about that is... When you look at pre-1970s, so just about, what, 50 years ago, the Second Amendment wasn't interpreted to mean that in the same way it is now. It's actually a lot of pro-gun groups like the NRA that were actually very fundamental in shaping that viewpoint that has now become the accepted viewpoint within society because they're very good at you know, promoting that, that uh, in the culture. Okay, so let's go through some more of their pro and cons. You have um, the people who are for gun control say more gun control laws would reduce gun deaths. And then those against it say that gun control laws do not deter crime, gun ownership deters crime. Which again, um, the real key here though is 
this is fine to look at their different policy perspectives or the different expectations of how things work. But ultimately, we have to look at what does the empirical data show us? As sociologists, we know that our own biases and perspectives can impact the way that we can look at an issue. So what can help us clarify an issue is looking at research methods and just looking at data. And we find that, you know, uh, gun ownership does not deter crime. This whole good guy with a gun thing is not meted out by the data. Also, it's interesting just to kind of note there's many other countries that have like a lot of gun ownership, but they don't have a lot of the same kind of gun crimes we have here. So again, as sociologists, we have to think what cultural aspects are happening here? Is it our kind of patriarchal views? Is our rugged individualism? Is it our, you know, super West, expand West, uh, manifest destiny, which again, is just a nice way of like pretending like because, uh, again, we, we associate guns with the Old West, but we don't associate with the fact that part of the Homesteading Act was the government would actually justify you killing indigenous people to settle that land. We talk about settling the West. It, like, people lived there already. It wasn't... Ugh, ugh, anyway, sorry. Don't let me get go down that path. Okay. Um, let's see. People who were for uh, gun control say that high-capacity magazines should be banned because they often... Uh, happen to um, be really convenient for mass murderers because they can kill so many people. Like you look at that Vegas shooting where one man was able to kill so many people because he had such a high capacity magazine. Um, and people who are against gun control say, well, that infringes upon self-defense and denies people a sense of safety to have like military style weapons at home, I guess. Um, so People who are for gun control say that there's more laws that were needed to protect women from domestic abusers and stalkers. Um, so, for instance, um, there's a there's a lot of data. I teach family violence as well, and there's a lot of data that shows that um, people who are physically abusive, um, when they have guns, it often escalates to killing their domestic partner, their spouse, you know, um, and oftentimes, um, you know, stalkers about about. 70% of the time that someone is murdered by, um, you know, so in some sort of domestic capacity, it's preceded by stalking. So we should take that very seriously as a threat. And actually just recently they passed, well, not quite recently, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, generally recently, they passed this thing called uh, the boyfriend loophole because there were, there were some provisions that said if you have a domestic violence charge, you can't access guns in the same way. But that only worked for married couples and it didn't account for people who were dating but not married. And so um, Cori Bush is a House member that talked very specifically about her own victimization and how her ex-boyfriend shot at her. And she knew he had a gun. She knew he was violent, but she never thought it was going to happen until it did happen. And um, she was, you know, instrumental in passing that boyfriend loophole. So anyway, um... People who are against gun control say that if you try to ban assault weapons, that infringes upon the right of people to own guns for hunting and sport. I don't know what you're hunting with an assault rifle, but you must not be very good at hunting. Um, people who are against uh, or who want more gun control say guns are rarely used in self-defense. And people who don't want to regulate guns say that gun control laws will not prevent criminals from obtaining guns. Um, you got the pro gun control. People say legally owned fire or legal legally owned guns are frequently stolen and used by criminals, like for instance, like Columbine. Um, and people who are against gun control say gun control laws give too much power to the government and can result in tyranny of the government taking away all the guns from citizens. I think that's really the key fear, right, of um, people in this gun debate, um, people that are against gun control, is they're afraid like the government's going to come and take all their guns away. Um, which has never really been a proposed as a solution, but it is a pretty good scare tactic to motivate funding to the NRA and other groups. Um, because that's not, that's not really what anyone's advocating for, at least not for traditional guns, such as, um, you know, handguns or rifles or things of this nature. But it's more about the kind of, um, you know, automatic weapons, military style weapons, large magazines that have been used in so many high profile mass shootings in recent years. Um, let's see here. Um, people who are for gun control say it would reduce societal costs associated with gun violence. 
and that even a majority of gun owners themselves support common sense gun control, such as background checks or bans on assault weapons or bans on high capacity magazines. Um, and they point out too that more gun control leads to fewer suicides. Things that we don't talk about is the fact that so many people, when we talk about gun violence in this culture, are just taking their own lives, specifically men, um, taking their own lives every day uh, because of the easy access of guns. And that's that's incredibly problematic, especially in a culture where we're not offering people robust mental health treatment. People who are against gun control say that background checks and micro stamping are an invasion of privacy, that more gun control is unnecessary because p few people are actually killed by guns, which again, I don't know. I don't know what your level of how many people need to die from guns before it's considered too many. Um, so again, that's kind of interesting and debatable. Gun control laws, in their view, um, lower gun ownership rates, but that doesn't prevent suicides in the viewpoint of people against gun control. Um, they say more gun control isn't needed, just more education about guns and safety is needed to pre prevent accidental, accidental gun deaths. Um, and that gun control laws would actually prevent citizens from protecting themselves from foreign invaders. But advocates for gun control say that having more mandatory safety features would reduce the number of accidental gun deaths. So for instance, um, you know, making sure that people have to kind of go through some sort of process of that safety training when they get a gun, or um, a actually really interesting development, I think, just a side note, is um, what they call smart guns. So the idea that like when you open up your phone, it can be based on your face or sometimes a thumbprint or things like this, and they've actually developed the technology to do this with guns as well. So think about this from a law enforcement perspective. You're carrying a gun, you're walking on the beat, and that gun, as much as it's for you to protect yourself, it could actually then be wrestled out of your hand and used against you. But if it's a smart gun, it only responds to the person's hand or fingerprints that is the owner of that gun. So for instance, a child gets the gun in the house and tries to fire it, they can't fire it. Or, you know, again, a, a suspect is on the ground with a police officer and they're wrestling and um, the gun goes wild and this person grabs it, they're not able to fire it. When it came to funding some expansion of this stuff, it's been really, really uh, protested by groups like the NRA um, when a lot of folks see it as kind of a practical policy solution to like not get rid of guns, but also provide more safety. Um, so basically people that are for gun control say that the presence of a gun makes conflict more likely to become violent, um, you know, versus again, the people that say that, well, what if foreign invaders come and I want to protect myself, right? Which again, I don't know what scenario they'd be in where the government wouldn't be involved in some aspect of that as well. Um, and they say, you know, strict gun control laws don't work in Mexico, so it's not going to work in the U.S., but it's kind of an apples to oranges comparison. Um, they also say gun control laws are racist. Not sure about that one. And then um, the Second Amendment was intended to protect gun ownership of all able-bodied men so they could participate in a militia to keep the peace and defend the country if needed. So they say that, you know, um, gun control should just not be done. It's not patriotic. While people that advocate for gun control say, you know, armed civilians are unlikely to stop crimes and actually are more likely to make situations more dangerous. So, for instance, if a police officer is responding to a mass shooting and someone else is there with a gun trying to confront the shooter, how are they going to tell which one is which? Right. How would they know in those situations? And what if that person is not actually well trained? But yeah, we take for granted the idea that anyone could intervene in those situations and the fact that the human body goes through a lot of stress responses in times of panic and chaos. And people like armed forces individuals, police, and other people that are you know trained to deal with these issues have to go through a lot of training so that they can react clear-headed and focused in a situation of chaos um, when a lot of us, even as well-intentioned or well-minded that we might be would just not be able to you know perform correctly like what if that person then shoots the wrong person like it's just it again it's this idea that um actually they've done some of these simulation trainings with folks where they've said okay well you're a concealed carry permit person um let's put you into a situation where an ambiguous threat is going to happen and let's see how quickly you can respond to it with blanks in your gun 
And um, you can, oh, look it up on YouTube. It's fascinating. Um, they don't do well, is what I'm trying to say. And that's really the kind of the key there is it takes a lot of training and, you know, diligence to be able to respond to these things effectively. That's why what's interesting is you often see even unarmed or armed, you'll see the intervention of folks in some of these mass shootings that are either, you know, not just uh, police, but like sometimes former military folks. Like, for instance, there's a couple uh, school, like college mass shootings where this was the case where, um, you know, former military individuals that were at the campus, instead of running away from the bullets, ran towards them as they were trained to do to kind of stop these issues from happening, put themselves in harm's way um, to protect others. And, you know, it's again, it's not it's not something that you can just do without that kind of training. You know, it's not Call of Duty. Um, also, um, you know, people that are for gun control say that um, countries that have restrictive gun control laws have much lower gun homicide and suicide rates in the U.S. That um, the Second Amendment was intended to protect the right of a militia to own guns, not the right of individuals. I mean, it literally says it in the words. And that civilians, including hunters, should not own military-grade firearms or firearm accessory accessories. So basically, I think that's kind of where it comes down to for a lot of uh, pro gun control folks is like, where do we draw the line on what's allowed and what's not? Like, are you allowed to have an RPG? Are you allowed to have a tank? Um, are you allowed to have assault style weapons? And again, high capacity magazines so that within moments you can shoot hundreds of rounds. Um, again, <laughs> if that's for hunting, then you're not doing a very good job right? Like the idea is if these, there's plenty of people out there that, that legitimately hunt and still think that there should be some forms of better background checks or gun control. Um, and these folks, they do it in such a way that even though they are killing something, there's really kind of preserving an ecosystem and they care about that preservation because otherwise that tradition of hunting would be lost. So they're not going in with an AK-47 and trying to take down a deer, right? Oftentimes it's one shot one well-placed shot from a rifle um, that fells whatever it is they're hunting. So um, even some of those arguments are really interesting. So again, a lot of this has to do with our culture and the ways in which the rhetoric in society colors our ability to kind of understand these issues. And because they become more and more and more partisan over time, there's so much less uh, kind of gray area in between, which makes it very difficult to find common ground and then compromise to find, you know, better solutions for some of these issues in society.